So I'm gonna start in the transmission again so that people can see the slide, right? Yeah. We can see your your window, your navigator window. Now we can't.
Okay, so welcome everybody to this astronomy activity that uh, we are organizing in the framework of the European project AHEAD 2020, which is dedicated to the general networking for the high energy astrophysics and with the collaboration of its participant institutions. Let me name you. The Institute of Physics of Cantabria, located in the Spanish city of Santander. The National Observatory of Athens in Greece. And the Institute for Astronomy, Astrophysics, Space Applications and Remote Sensing, also in Athens. And first of all, let me introduce you the people who are behind this project. So here you have these people. So I'm Maite Ceballos, my colleague Francisco Carrera. We are also at the Institute of Physics of Cantabria. In the National Observatory of Athens, you have Ioannis Georgantopoulos, Hector Pauliansis. And then at the ERSARS, you have Bagelis Kolokotronis and Lazarus Kotodulidis. So, let me present you the script for this activity. It will have uh, four parts. After this uh, presentation, you will have an introductory talk about planets in the solar system, general knowledge, and how can we observe them uh, with uh, optical telescopes and with other kind of instruments. Then we will show you a short video about the X-ray emission of these solar system planets. Uh, this video was produced as part of the public outreach activities in this European project ahead 2020. Then you will have the opportunity to see a video presentation about the National Observatory and its relation to, to the European project. We will give you some time for questions if you have uh, questions of doubts or curiosities. And, we will proceed with a live observation from Athens. We will try to observe Saturn and Jupiter, weather permitting. And we end up with an online contest using the Quizit platform application to test how many things you have been able to learn this night and how is your knowledge about planets improving? So, Let's start. I'm gonna stop sharing my, my screen so that people in Athens can present planets. So the floor is yours. So Kalispera, good evening from Greece. Good evening from the National Observatory of Athens. We are sitting at the operation room of the historical Newell Telescope, which can see behind us. You can see the nine meter uh, tube. It was uh, constructed in 1869, 150 years approximately ago. And it was the largest refractor telescope on the earth till 1873. Keep in mind that this is a manual telescope, not a robotic one. But let's share our presentation now. Okay. Okay, can you see it? Okay. This is the outside view of the dome of the Newell telescope, which uh, has been built by Pentelic marble, just like our par Parthenon. And, uh, but why we are sitting here? Why we, do we need telescope? What the information does a telescope collect? In astronomy and astrophysics, we use telescope in order to gather information in form of light. 
coming from the stars. This is another telescope from a nearby dome that houses a robotic telescope where it will uh, where will be making the observation tonight. But also the sun is also a star. Can we observe the sun with telescope? The, ob the obvious answer is yes. And we use solar telescope. A solar telescope can shown here and so we can observe stars during the morning and during the night. So let's give the floor to the leader of the visitor center of Penteli, Dr. Evangelos Kolokotronis, who will guide us to our solar system. Thank you, Lazare. Thanks, everybody, and good evening. Uh, as you can see in this slide, there are two actual telescopes. The one has been used and is being used uh, for, you know, uh, night stars and the other, the smaller one, it's a solar telescope. So next slide has to do with the solar telescope. This uh, extraordinary picture shows the sun. So it's actually the chromosphere of the sun thank, thanks to a colleague of ours called Yanis Dakanalis, we thank him in public. And we can see the solar activity. This image is very nice and has been taken on the 30th of, of September, which is a week ago. So we can see the solar activity, we can see prominences, which uh, if you can see here and follow my mouse, it's, it's called, oh, sorry, sorry about this. It's a solar prominent, prominences here, which is hot gas. And we can see the so-called rivers in the sun, which are called actual filaments. So the point is that we are heading towards the solar maximum uh, where we, we're going to have the maximum activity of the sun. And the uh, National Observatory of Athens has many telescopes because we have so many astronomical objects to observe, night and day, 24-7. So let's go on and talk about a little bit about the solar system, which is the main topic uh, of, this, of this meeting uh, today. So we can see it's, uh, it's a famous picture of NASA showing the sun and the and the planets uh, like soldiers. So what can we gather from this image is that the sun is huge. It's almost a hundred times larger than Earth. And if you try for yourselves to pick out Earth, you have to be on the left. You have to start from the left. It's the third planet on the left. Follow my mouse again. It's there, whereas you can see the moon just in front uh, of Earth. And we can see here these uh, black dots, which are called sunspots. We can see the gaseous planet, the big giants here, and so on. So sun is the center of the solar, si of the solar system. But what's a solar system? Solar system, is it this slide, which is a very nice picture, very famous again, showing the sizes and the distances the sizes and the actual distances, distances of the sun and the planets. If you look on the left here, follow my mouse again, you see the, the small four terrestrial planets. It's Mercury, uh, then it's Venus, then it's Earth, and, and the small one there is Mars, very close to the sun. And if you go a large distance there, you can see Jupiter, which we hope to observe later on, weather permitting and wind permitting, Saturn there sitting comfortably at one and a half billion kilometers, very far away, Uranus there, and far uh, to the right is Neptune. So if we, if we imagine in our minds the actual distance, you see that it takes light from the sun, eight and a half minutes to get to Earth, and then about 33 minutes to go from sun to Jupiter, and then about 77 uh, light minutes to go to Saturn. So everything we see, everything we observe in the universe 
starting from the closest thing, which is the moon, comes with a delay. Everything is past. And this is another nice slide showing you, uh, depending on which planet you pick to be on, how big the sun would look like. So if you pick Mercury, which is far left on this slide, you, you see a big, you see a very large sun, albeit there's no life there. If you pick Earth, you know the answer, you get accustomed to it. But if you pick Neptune, which is on the far right, of, or even Uranus, you see a very small dot. Sun would look, would look like uh, a single point source. So that's the whole story about the solar system. If you take a slice and you concentrate on the yellow big dot, which is uh, the sun, it takes about, uh, in distance, now we're talking about distance, it takes about 30 astronomical units. Bear in mind that one astronomical unit marks the distance between uh, Earth and Sun is about 150 million kilometers. So this, uh, this area, this black area, is a planetary area. Next to it is the Kuiper Belt zone up to, it starts from the 30 astronomical units up to a thousand, uh, more than a thousand, which is called the Kuiper Belt object, um, um, sorry, region. Uh, in there, there are small astronomical objects like Pluto and his company. And further on, we can meet the so-called Oort Cloud, which is the neighborhood of the comets. It's an amazing large amount of comets, of comets sitting there. Okay? Uh, a last bit about the radius of the solar system. The size of the radius of the solar system is one light year, which is a unit of length, it's not a unit of time. So it takes the light of the sun one year from the sun to the end of the solar system. It takes a year, speeding with the speed of light. And this is the last bit I'm going to talk about today. This is the actual picture on the formation of the solar system as we speak, as it is today. We see the yellow dot, of course, it's the sun. Uh, if you follow my mouse arrow, then it's Earth. And up there is planet Mars, which is currently sitting on a distance of 100 million kilometers which means that in the near future, next week and next month, Earth is going to be closer to Mars. And uh, we hope the, windy, uh, the, windy, well, the wind will be coming down so we can be able to show you in uh, 10 or more minutes, Jupiter and Saturn. So, Lazar, okay. are you ready? Let's focus again in our closest star, the Sun. And uh, according to this slide, the question that arises is which object do you think is the sun? Is the yellow one, the red one, the blue one, or the green one? Okay, this is a rhetoric question because all the above images represent the sun. Keep in mind that each image corresponds to different filter which corresponds to different energy, which originates from different layers of the hot, from the hot atmosphere of the sun. So, if we combine all the information, we take a colorful sun like all stars. So, keep in mind again that different colors correspond to different energies. If someone wants to combine, to include all the information from different energies in one simple shape, then we will take the so-called electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum starts from radio, which corresponds to lower energies, and ends up to X-ray and gamma ray, which correspond to higher energies, and as you can see, in the, bot in, the, in the bottom bar here, to higher temperatures. So, also you can see, notice that we can see a tiny part 
of electromagnetic spectrum, the so-called visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So in order to observe in different energies, we need to adjust special suitable equipment equipments in the telescope. But there is a problem because the Earth's atmosphere blocks a large amount of radiation coming from especially the sun and from the other stars. That's the reason we need space telescope and in order to build a complete, let's say, image, we must combine both ground-based telescopes and space telescopes. So, a very nice example of multi-wavelength approach is Jupiter. We can see Jupiter through different eyes. For example, from using the, the eye from James Webb telescope, as you can see in the upper left image, and we can use Gemini and Hubble Space Telescope in order to observe invisible or infrared uh, wavelengths. Another example of a multi-wavelength approach is our planet Earth. As you can see, the many phases of the Earth in infrared goes to ultraviolet, to extreme ultraviolet, and to higher energies like X-rays and gamma rays. So, and this is the image, we ca you can see the X-ray sun, which depicts the strong magnetic activity, especially in the equator. So let's imagine that our eyes are sensitive only to X-ray wavelength. Which planet do you think is this? We must focus on this bright region, which corresponds to the famous aurora coming from the interaction between the solar particles and the atmosphere and the magnetic field. So this planet is the Earth. But what about if a planet or generally an object does not have atmosphere or strong magnetic field? Is it possible to observe X-rays from this object? focus on this object and this object is the moon. You can see in the right panel that the surface of the moon reflects X-rays, but X-rays, where does it come from? From the solar radiation, from our sun. You can compare the two images and now it's time because the most charming image is the live image of the moon. So give us two minutes in order to go to observe to the moon. Let's give the floor again to Vangelis to demonstrate you the basic movements of the Neural Telescope. Thank you for listening us. Okay. Thank you, Lazare. So Lazarus is actually going to the small dome where we have targeted the moon to uh, a few settings a little bit so i can if you can see behind me it's it's the neural telescope i'm trying to set the image for you and i think i should stop share it's, oh sorry okay Yeah, perfect. We can see you. Okay. All right. So I'll try. I'll try to move. To move. A bit. Okay. 
I hope it was visible. Was it? Yep. All right, and, let, and let's just wait for Lazarus. It's not going to take more than a few minutes for uh, having the moon here with us. I have to warn you that this is a very windy night here in uh, North Athens. Uh, so what we're actually going to show you, it's the best we can do. So okay. here you can see the moon. We are trying to, to adjust it and calibrate the image because it's really windy here in Athens. Vangelis, the floor is yours. Yeah, I know. I'm just waiting for you. But yeah, all, all right. This is very close to the, uh, the face of the moon tonight. It's very close to full moon, which is actually in two days. So don't expect much. It's not astronomically correct, I have to say, but still it's very charming. So the first thing I can see here is a large, a large crater. The near side of the moon, which we concentrate on, are full of craters, uh, but as, as here, if you follow my mouse, or there, in the north of the image, or there. But we can also see these flat, dark regions, which the famous Galileo called Maria, which means seas. Well, he didn't know. Actually, he was the first guy uh, building an astronomical telescope and observing the moon. And uh, he didn't know, of course, he thought that the moon had seas. It's actually basaltic fields. It's, so to speak, frozen lava. So uh, I think I will ask Lazarus to uh, make a small tour of the moon using the joystick. Lazarus, can you do that slowly? Using the joystick in mode two. Yes, something like that. Excellent. So more, more craters in, our, uh, in this image and more Maria. We go from north to south, trying to adjust everything. Sorry about the camera. The conditions are not very nice, but still there's no cloud in the sky. And that makes us think that uh, cloudless skies are not enough to make astronomical observations. We need a lot of conditions all together for us to make a nice image. All right. Uh, what, to say, what to say more about the moon is that currently is in the distance of 373,000 kilometers. As I said before, in today's time, I think, uh, Sunday, Sunday, uh, Sunday evening, it's the full moon. Uh, on the left of the image, I think we can see space. It's the end of the moon, if I'm not very wrong. Yes, it's the end of the moon, and we can see empty space. Okay, the wind is very no very noisy, and I think uh, we should. Call it a pause, stop sharing the moon, I think, and uh, let's go to, uh, to see the nice, the nice X-ray video and a video about the new telescope. Maite? Yeah, thanks a lot. Really nice images about the moon, even with the wind. Yeah, but it's really nice to see live, right? Yes. So I let the floor to my colleague Francisco, and he's going to present us something relating next rays and planets. We heard about it a bit, but let's see. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Angelis. Thank you, Maite. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Kalispera, buenas tardes. I will stop like that because otherwise I'm going to sound like Eurovision. 
So this is just a short introduction uh, of the video I'm going to show. It's a very short video, three, three and a half minutes. So I hope you don't get too bored about it. And it is a somewhat technical description of what would you see if you were able to see next rays when you look at the planets. So we're going to see the planets for real in a few minutes uh, in, with our eyes, with our real eyes. So this is an introduction of our X-ray eyes in space. So I will, sh I will share my screen here. I uh, hope you can see it. I go for full yeah. screen now, hopefully. And now there we go. We are used to seeing the planets in optical light. They look beautiful, but we can change the way we look at them. We can look in X-rays and see a totally different view. Our sun is a star. Its outer atmosphere called corona is hot gas at a million degrees, which not only emits optical light, but also X-rays. But planets do not contain hot gas. They do not emit optical light or X-rays by themselves. We just see the light from the sun reflected on them. The study of X-ray emissions from solar system bodies gives us key and unique clues about the planets. We learn about the density and chemical composition of the atmosphere, the surface and rings of the planets, and about the interactions between their atmospheres and their magnetic fields. And also about the nature of the solar wind and its interaction with the planets. X-ray observations of other stars like our Sun can tell astronomers about the high energy environment around the star and the prospects for life to develop around them. The hydrogen dominated atmospheres of Jupiter and Saturn act as diffuse mirrors where the solar X-ray photons reflect without changing their energy causing the majority of their equatorial emission of X-rays, which varies with the solar X-ray intensity. In Venus and Mars, equatorial X-rays are mainly due to a mechanism called fluorescence. In their atmospheres, larger molecules like CO2 or nitrogen are relatively more abundant. When solar X-rays are absorbed by the atoms in these molecules, they cause the ejection of electrons from their inner shells. The vacancies are then filled by electrons from outer shells releasing the extra energy as X-ray photons. In some planets, like Earth or Jupiter, X-ray auroras can be observed from the poles. Jupiter's auroras are thought to be produced by the precipitation of particles from the solar wind or from Io's volcanoes through a mechanism called charge exchange. These particles are ions transported by plasma waves caused by periodic vibrations in Jupiter's magnetic field. These ions have a high charge and collide with neutral species, water, oxygen, hydrogen, in the atmosphere. The ion takes one electron from the neutral species. This leaves the ion in an excited state, which then produces one or more X-ray photons in the de-excitation. Saturn rings bright in X-rays, probably due to the fluorescence produced by solar X-rays that strike oxygen atoms in the water molecules of the icy rings. The contribution to current X-ray missions, XMM, Newton and Chandra, to our knowledge of the X-ray solar system has been invaluable. The new ESA mission, Athena, will enable a new scientific revolution. The unprecedented spectral resolution of its XIFU instrument will allow the scientists to reveal the mysteries of the contribution of the different X-ray components. Okay, so I hope that with this video and the excellent introduction by our good colleagues, you've understood and learned a bit more about planets, which we will check later on with the quizzes. And then I guess um, we're going back to... Oh. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot, Francisco. Really interesting. If we had X-ray eyes, right? How many things we could see? in our own solar system. So just before um, starting the real observation and giving time to our colleagues in Greece to go to the telescope and open the dome and all that stuff, let me put you some video introduction of the National Observatory. 
just a couple of minutes and we will start with the observation. I share the screen. Okay. So that's it. Okay, so this is our presentation of the National Observatory in Athens. So are you ready for the observation? We are going to give some opportunity for the, for the questions. Oh, I can see Saturn here. Let me check if there is some question. Oh, we can start with the observations, but let people check in the chat. Okay, give me a minute. So I have one question for Francisco while I'm waiting for the people to ask their own questions. Because we are very used to see uh, and to think about the light, the normal optical light as arriving at our eyes, and this is how vision is produced. 
But sometimes when we think of x-rays, we remember some hero called Superman that the x-rays started from their eyes to see an x-rays. How can you tell us if this is correct or is different to see in an optical light or in x-rays or how is this different? Uh, I, well, that's a very nice question. I wouldn't worry about Superman being able through to see uh, underpants or anything like that because it doesn't actually work that way, right? As, as Maite said, and actually uh, he said in the presentation and also said in the video, we only see things because light bounces off them and, and comes to our eyes in the optical and in x-rays, exactly the same mechanism or in radio or infrared, whichever way. So only with there is a source emitting a lot of light and some of that light bounces of things and come to our eyes, we will be able to see those things. So even if Superman were, was able to see in X-rays, he would need something else to emit the X-rays, bounce off us and, and come to his eyes. And even that case, since what happens with X-rays is that they are very penetrating, they would go through our flesh. So the only thing Superman would see to his disappointment is the bones within us, which may be very interesting for doctors and for, of course, to, to cure us of illnesses, but not very much for amateur purposes, let's say. <laughs> Thanks, Francisco. So, well, I see no questions in the chat yet. So maybe we're going to start with the observations in this real optical light, which is easier for us and our eyes are perfectly capable of uh, looking at this. Let's see this amazing view of the planets. Athens, you are now on the floor. Okay, uh, as you can see in this, in, the, in this real image, it's uh, planet Saturn, it's a gaseous planet. It's very big, it's about, its size is nine times size of the Earth in diameter, that is. The light we see, the light we see right now took 75, 77 minutes to actually get from, from Saturn to Earth. So we are currently observing Saturn as it was 77 lights ago. I talked about earlier, and this is very, very, very important for distances between you know, planets, uh, galaxies, stars, and everything. And it's everywhere in the universe. It has to do with the not infinite speed of light. Thank God, speed of light is huge, but it's not infinite. Otherwise, we would have been living in a very, very strange universe. Okay, uh, its current distance is about 1.4 billion kilometers. And I would, I, I would now ask Lazarus to a little, for a little overexposure of Saturn to uh, be able to see, okay, that's an overexposure. We need extra light to see the satellites. I can only see one, which is the biggest, the largest satellite. It's called Titan. It's the famous Titan, right? It's the second in size satellite of the solar system next to Ganymede, which I hope we'll be able to see later on because it's a satellite of Jupiter. Uh, so how about Titan? Titan is a huge satellite. It's about uh, two times, well, one and a half times the, uh, the size of our own moon. It's sitting comfortably at about 1.2 kilometers, millions of kilometers from Saturn. This distance, if you follow my mouse, is about 1.2 millions of kilometers. It's far away. Okay, I'm telling you this in order to judge for yourself the size of the current of, of this image. Uh, so the story about Titan goes like that. The Titan has a very thick atmosphere of organic molecules like uh, carbon, methane, and stuff like this. 
Each surface is fully mapped by uh, the spacecraft called Huygens uh, some uh, 20 years or some 15 years ago. And we now know that the surface of Titan is full of rivers and lakes. In what temperature, you would ask? And I would answer it's about minus 180. Methane, which is carbon, hydrogen, four, is liquid in that temperature. So uh, I, would, I would like to say here that it's a very nice place to go and do some spa, albeit it's very, very cold. Okay, Lazare, I think uh, we can undo the overexposure and enjoy the system of the seven rings. Thank you. All right. I think I'll stop speaking for a while to enjoy the shaky shutter. Much better. It's much better. Apart from the fact that it's the Lord of the Rings in the solar system, it's the Lord of the satellites. It has many more satellites than uh, Jupiter. It has actually eight three satellites, but discovering satellites in the solar system, it's a dynamic phenomenon. It doesn't mean that it only has 83 satellites. It's 83 we know now. And this is the whole picture about astronomy, that it's a dynamical science. We keep on searching uh, stuff based on theories, based on theories and observations. Okay, I think we should be moving right now to the next object, Lazare. Okay. Which inevitably will be Jupiter. I think Jupiter is lower on the horizon, so it will be a bit more shaky than Saturn was. I hope it's not. So the story about Jupiter was that uh, a few weeks ago or a few days ago, uh, actually was on the 20, 25th of September, it was at the closest distance for this year uh, to the Earth, from, from the Earth, which was measured around 590 millions of kilometers. Now, today I checked, I last checked, it was on 594. So it moved four millions of kilometers in a period of uh, a week. So it runs, it runs a lot, yeah? It run, Jupiter runs a lot, rotates a lot. And no, no, I'm sorry, revolves around the sun a lot. And Earth does the same. So let's just wait for Jupiter to come. I have to say before the picture, before the image comes that it's the largest planets of the solar system in size, uh, but not in satellites. Its distance is around 600 millions of kilometers or a bit less to this day. It has around 80 satellites. And I hope we will be able to observe and discern the four Galilean satellites, uh, shaky Jupiter, mm -hmm. okay, no satellites though. So I think Lazarus in a short while will try to show the three Galilean, the four Galilean satellites. You can see on the upper left of the image, 
uh, I think is Io there, Europa there, and Callisto to the far left. Callisto is to the far left, exactly. That's Callisto. And I should be able to see Ganymede on the right side. So I think it's a good idea if we could Lazare move the telescope. Okay. Here we'll be able to see Ganymede, which is the largest satellite of our solar system, an icy and very cold world. Uh, the distance between Jupiter and Ganymede, thank you, Lazare, you're very helpful. It's about 1 million kilometers. 1 million kilometers. You currently see 1 million kilometers. On the other hand, if you focus at if you focus on Io, let's just focus on Io, please. Yes, that's Io. It's about 400,000 kilometers. 400,000 kilometers, and it's a very tortured world. And I say tortured because it's extremely close to huge planet Jupiter, and it faces many problems like extremely extreme volcanic activity. It's the most volcanic world of the whole solar system, it has about 400 active volcanoes, showering plumes of nitrogen and sulfur dioxide and stuff, you know, stuff like this. Uh, I gather there's hope for life there, but I think from what I've heard about planetary science and, and studied about planetary science, uh, the hope stands with Europa, which is far left of the picture. Europa must be, Europa must be just above Io. Oh, all right, that's the one. Europa is in, uh, is a nice place. From observations, we gather that there is a nice crust, the size of which is around several hundreds of kilometers. Behind this thing, uh, it must be an ocean. And if there's an ocean there, liquid ocean there, there must be hope for life. So, these are the four Galilean satellites, and I call them Galilean satellites because the first guy to actually observe them was Galileo, as I said before, in uh, 1613, almost 400 years ago, using a one meter telescope in size, but its diameter was very small. It was around four centimeters. Four centimeters is like exactly this. Lazare, could you undo the overexposure to actually enjoy uh, the clouds of Jupiter? Thank you. Now we, could, we can enjoy the uh, clouds of Jupiter. And when I say clouds, I mean the atmosphere of Jupiter, which is there. You can see how shaky is Jupiter right now because the optical light reflected on there and coming to uh, coming towards us has to go through the Earth's atmosphere. And the, Earth, the Earth's atmosphere is extremely windy right now, if you talk about Athens, of course. All right, Jupiter is made primarily of hydrogen and helium. It's the same, very, it's the very same ingredients uh, that the sun comprises, well, it's actually the ingredients, the ingredients of the sun. But the sun is a star, emits lights, emits light. Jupiter is a wannabe star. It's not a star, it's a planet. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, both astronomical objects are made of uh, the same chemical elements. Although the dose, the dosage is very different. And that makes the difference between the, a planet and a star. Sun, from the one hand, could have been able 
to, uh, to start the nuclear fusion inside its heart and emit light. Although Jupiter was not so lucky and remained a planet. Thank God. So imagine, imagine in a future scenario that we live in a solar system with two stars. That would be very nice for life to develop, I think. And I'll stop there and let you enjoy the Sega Jupiter. For a while, that is. Okay, Lazarus, thank you very much for the observing run. And I think we have enough time to enjoy planets and the moon. And uh, give the floor to Maite for, uh, uh, for the rest of the night. Thank you, thank you guys. Really amazing, really amazing. It's kind of magical looking and watching the planets with your eyes, life, that's no? really nice, in spite of the wind, but the real vision of the planet is amazing. Thanks for, for these explanations, very clear and very amazing to learn a lot of things. So we hope that the people listening and watching this event have learned a lot about planets. So now we are going to try how much they have learned. Hmm. Will you join us with a contest? I'm sure you will. So what would you need for this contest? Just your smartphone or a laptop, anything you have to watch this event. So let me show you how this works. So I'm not sure. Okay, so. I'm no, I, I know that you are familiar with quizzes contests, but for those of you that have never played, let me try to explain how this works. It's very, very easy. You only need, as I said, a smartphone or uh, your laptop or whatever. So you have to open a browser, Chrome, Firefox, your internet explorer, whatever, and write, this sentence there, joinmysquiz.com, right? We only have to write this sentence in the browser bar, joinmyquiz.com. And when the system asks you for a code, for a number, write these six numbers, 355098. And uh, enter your name or your avatar, whatever, and we will see how many of you are playing. You will see all the questions in your device and you will have to choose the correct one. For some questions, there can be more than one correct answer. So be careful and don't forget to submit your uh, choices, right? I'm going to tell you when these multiple uh, questions happen. So, Maite, if I may, if I may say a word. Yeah. I think let's just give people a little bit more time to prepare. Yes. Let's just yeah, for too, sure. Yeah, just five minutes to prepare themselves. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, okay. There is no hurry, and and yeah, no hurry. I know that the YouTube has a bit of delay, so. We are going to to wait for you. Give you 
couple of five minutes to start. Don't be shy. If you have any question, ask in the chat and we will try to help you. Okay, the first arriving. And just the final advice. Once we start with uh, the contest, don't look at YouTube because there is a bit of a delay. So as I'm going to start uh, in my computer, you can follow through your smartphone or your connection in the laptop, but forget YouTube for a while, right? Just follow on your laptop or on your smartphone. Okay, I see people are still joining. So I think we're gonna start, do you think? Yeah, let's start so that you don't get bored. So, ready? Are you a planet expert? You will have one minute for each question. As soon as everyone has answered, the time is uh, closed, so don't worry. You will have time to answer. Let's go. Okay, everyone has answered. So, one, five correct answers because the correct answer is Mercury. Pluto is not an answer because Pluto is not a planet. So, almost there. Next question. Ready? <laughs>
almost there. Answer is well, this, this is the letter board. The correct answer is four, four planets. Do you have some of you have thought that only two planets? Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus, all of them have uh, rings. So let's see. Next question. Ios, remember Ios from our previous observation? Observe two, so maybe one of them. Okay, you have to be fast. So things are moving on. Jupiter. Yeah, we saw this in our last observation from Athens. Io is the most volcanic object and is one of the satellites of Jupiter. Next question. Water x-rays. This will have two possible answers. Remember to give them all and click on submit after that. So the correct answer is that this is a type of electromagnetic radiation. As you heard uh, on the presentation of the planets that we can see with different eyes, this is just another type of light. The X-rays are not machines. X-rays are light. And maybe you didn't know that X-rays it's a musical band. I just learned it. So it's a curious thing. So ready for the next one? The planets mix X-rays by themselves.
Okay. So the correct answer is no. No. The planets do not emit X rays by themselves, like the sun, because the sun is a star and it is hot. It does contain hot gas, but this is not the case for the planets. Let's go on. We see x-rays because that's right, the hydrogen in the atmosphere reflects the sun's x-ray light. This is just the reflection of the light coming from the sun. Let's move on. The leather bar is moving and the real answer is fluorescence. All these words sound similar, right? But this is the phenomenon causing the equatorial emission of X-rays in Venus and Mars fluorescent. Remember from the video? The video is available on YouTube. Remember that? From the AHEAD 2020 European project. And let's move on. To another question. Jupiter Auroras. Okay, this is this was a difficult one. 
Yeah, maybe a bit. Nikos is on top. And the answer was these highly charged particles that are still electrons from molecules in the atmosphere of Jupiter and then emit the extrins. This is a physics wording mechanism, right? Go on. We are almost there. Saturn rings. Saturn rings. So the winners still win. They are brave. So the Saturn rings are bright because the solar X rays strike oxygen atoms in the icy rings. And this produced this phenomenon that we saw before fluorescence in the atomic structure. So just the solar X-rays is striking the material in the rings. And ready to finish? Let's see who is the final winner. This is a multiple one, right? You have to choose all of them. This is a final movement in the leatherboard. So we had a triple choice question here. The missions that we will, are observing or will observe in X-rays are Athena for the end of the uh, 30s, examine Newton and Chandra, which are now observing. They have been in the space for a while, and they are giving us beautiful images of the planets in X-rays. So, let's wait a bit and we will show you the final list of winners. So, 
This is a podium. Are you looking at it? Lie H is the first one. Nikos and Pilar, congratulations you all for this amazing contest, for your participation. Thanks a lot. You have learned a lot or you did already know a lot. So thanks for, for sharing. Thanks for participating. Thanks for being with us in this event. Let's say, uh, let people in Athens say goodbye to everybody. Hello, Vrade. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you for your amazing images and this time with the telescope. It has been a pleasure. Mate, I think next time we hope we have better conditions so we'll be able to see the stars and planets with no wind. Let's hope so. Well, this is weather. This is real life, right? So astronomers know a lot about this, going to a telescope and not being able to observe. This is life. This is life. We, we have been very uh, lucky today to be able to look at the planets. So thank, thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you, Pagelis, Lazarus, Ioannis, Hector. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Francisco, thank you very much. And thanks a lot to our public out there. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. See you Bye. soon. Bye. 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 Bye.